Hi, my name is Tim Carter, and I pastor Landmark Missionary Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Arkansas. Just like to take a moment of pause for a moment during our apologetic and outreach ministry. Uh, this book is called Defense of the Faith by Dr. Albert Garner. It was published in 1956. Actually, this is uh, an edition that was owned by my former pastor, Dr. Lynn Baxter. Yes, he allowed me to have it. And yes, we used it in the Missionary Baptist Seminary. It was a textbook, a course we had in, oh, in the late 80s. It was still being taught. He posed an interesting question. And I'd like to speak to that question. He asked, is it right to expose false doctrines or um, point out these fallacies in these particular religious orders? Well, I'm not sure that I would ask it in that manner. I would perhaps approach it, is it right for so much trouble to be caused by people who prefer talk over text? Uh, the Bible gives us a written word and Biblical Hebrew won't change. Um, the Koine Greek text is very inflected. It's a very wordy. By the time you spell it all out, it's self-evident what the author um, wanted to communicate. And you can know all that there is to know and be satisfied with that. So really the question would be, is it right for someone to, let's say, construct a gospel um, that depends upon which day of the week you worship God. For example, a group called Seventh-day Adventist, which I don't know anyone that has a problem in this country. We have the freedom of conscience, thought, and speech. It's acknowledged in our inalienable rights, the Bill of Rights, the history of Baptists, which is not a word for a denomination nor a religion, but it was a group of people or people who were so accused because they baptized and preached without a license. That is, the people who would practice their faith independent of state establishment, that is, without a state establishing them, uh, were very much uh, ardent fans, if you will, fan meaning considered fanatical about the First Amendment, the right to peaceably assemble. Uh, well, is it right for someone, uh, even though we support, that is, as Christians who are thankful that we have no state church in the United States. There's no church of England here. There's no church of Rome here. There's no church of the United States per se. Uh, but we're happy that there are people such as a Seventh-day Adventist group. Now they say, however, though, through some, with, without any hermeneutic integrity whatsoever, they can say, somehow gather in their own imagination a conclusion that if you attend church or worship on the wrong day of the week, that that's the mark of the beast. And you say, well, how'd they get there? I, no one would know. You'd have to ask them, and you'd have to be willing to go along with their convoluted reasoning. But now that is their freedom of conscience, thought, and speech, which I advocate that freedom and support it. But now, is it right for them then, when they say that, to say that people who worship on Sunday have received the mark of the beast and are consigned to everlasting damnation like a fire. I don't know about right or wrong. I do know that that's what they do, and I don't go out of my way to do anything about it. Rather, they seem to go out of their way to do something about what I preach, the correct message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what's written and what remains on record. No such text exists anywhere that says if you worship on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. But now, the question was, is it right to talk about these things? We don't talk about it. They condemn us. Is it right for a denomination that just started decades ago called the Church of Christ to say that he that believeth and is baptized shall be born again when no text says that? The text says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, delivered. Uh, the text says Noah was saved, delivered through water, not fathered through water, not born again through water. So is that right for them to say that? Well, it's not really a matter of right or wrong. It's their freedom of conscious thought and speech. Now, they seem to be irate enough to say that if you aren't baptized for the purpose of being born again, which no text says that, then they condemn you and say you're damned. So I really don't understand the question, is it right for us who are teaching what the Bible actually says and what's written and remains on record, uh, that's what we're called to do. That's why we're here. 
uh, we're born from above. We preach the same gospel through which we were generated, born from above. Is it right for numerous religious groups to come in and give different stipulations for a person to stand correctly before God when the Bible says that our standing and the purpose for us to believe into Christ deliberately cause ourselves to believe, Galatians 2.16, the simplest form of action, was in order that we might be justified, that is declared right out from the faith, the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. So it's not my faithfulness that's the basis of my standing before God, but it's Jesus' faithfulness. Well, religious orders of every stripe come out and say, no, that's not enough. You need to do something more. Uh, You need to, I don't know what they're talking about, but my standing before God is based on the righteousness, the faithfulness of Christ. And the faith we have that comes from God is being energized by love, so it won't fail because love never fails. So is it right for them to constantly, adamantly affirm that although the Bible says that once God loves someone directly, immediately, and personally, that He's always loving them, is it right for them to say that's not true? Is it right for the Bible, although it says and is written and remains on record that once we've been fathered, that we're always being fathered out from God? Is it right for them to say, no, that's not true? No text anywhere says otherwise. Is it right when the Bible says specifically and is written and remains on record that once we have been saved by the grace through faith, that's the Jesus through His faithfulness, once we've been saved by Him, that He's always, that we're always being saved by the grace, that is the Jesus through His faithfulness? Is it right for people to say otherwise, which nowhere is it written otherwise? Is it right for people when the Bible says and it's expressly stated and remains on record that the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the inheritance of us by the Father through the redemptive work of Christ? Is it right for people to say, well, there are no guarantees? Well, the Bible says, and it's written. So really the question is, is it right for the Scriptures to contradict what men say? Uh, We don't practice saying things that contradict the Scriptures. They do, and they're free to. And in this country, um, whatever you are, Catholic, some form of Protestant, maybe Judaic, Islamic, new age, occultic, or atheist, or agnostic, or anti-theist, whatever that is. We all live under the same rule of law. Uh, We Christians are only interested in the freedom to speak because the gospel we preach is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. So the question really is, uh, if there's any trouble being caused, you might want to check what the message is they're preaching. It's a message that somehow magically leads to, oh, you're damned if you don't believe in our doctrine of water baptism. Oh, you're damned if you don't believe in our day of worship and you went on the wrong day. Oh, you're damned if you don't accept some performance basis for maintaining your standing or achieving your standing before God. Oh, you're damned if this, if that, if that, if that, if that. Uh, The question would be, is it right for them to do that? Uh, It's called the error of emendation. It's when someone doesn't find what's written sufficient. And uh, give you an example, a lot of people today really have a lot to say, uh, talk about when it comes to um, creation. This is a great example. These top scholars, uh, Kyle and Dillich, this would be the top commentary in Hebrew. Uh, Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology would be the top theological, systematic theology book in the world now. This is the leading one used in seminaries all around the world. So here's the top commentary in Hebrew, top systematic theology book. And here is one of the leading, uh, most well-recognized authorities in Hebrew syntax, Walty and O'Connor. Well, they used something that was uh, a tradition that was placed onto the original text, vowel pointings, and they're so convinced that if the second verse of the Bible were to be come to be, that the um, world would truly, it would be a valid argument if the world were old. So they're, they're so convinced that they work to show how a, an uninspired vowel pointing system says otherwise. Well, who's causing the trouble now? Well, these people are because they're so convinced. But whatever it was, that this level of scholarship would still find a person subject to such pressure. I don't know. Uh, This uh, writer here, this excellent scholar, great work, he was so convinced that if 
Hayatha, Haya, a little word in the Hebrew text, verse 2, that if it is come to be, then it is a valid argument that the world is as old as science measures it to be. Um, I've never found a problem with what science was measuring. I, I don't know what the Bible teaches about how far the earth is from the sun either, but I've never had a problem with that. But he says that the translation become is doubtful and an alternative, or is an alternate translation. But now no substantial, he just said it. So that's called the error of emendation. He found the text insufficient. And then this commentator, before you even open the book, uh, you're hardly into the book, and he just says it's uh, was not become, in parentheses, parenthetically introduced it. So is it right for people to just say things and then others to go to these sources trusting that they are language-based, trusting that they adhere to the original meanings of words, trusting that. Uh, no, it's not something you would call fair. But again, that's freedom of uh, conscience, thought, and speech. If a Hebrew scholar wants to write a commentary, but then his own bias dominates and manipulates, well, why work so hard to learn all of this? But sometimes you have to think about how do we sell it? How do we move the merchandise? Uh, the same thing about different groups called uh, considered occultic groups. Uh, same thing today. Someone asked me why is um, about these leading televangelists, and I said I don't know why. For example, Joel Osteen. Why is it that he's so negative against the good news? Uh, we posit the text. We're thankful, but we can't find anything greater and better than what the Bible actually has written. And though Joel Osteen. He's so negative. He went along with a group who says, well, we have another Jesus besides the one in the Bible. We have a different gospel other than the one in the Bible. And he endorsed it. He said Mormonism, which is their freedom of conscience, thought, and speech. They originated in the United States. They're one of the most unique cults in the world um, or now considered a Christian religion. They do have a Jesus. They do have a gospel. Their Jesus did rise from the dead. Uh, he just happens to be the brother of Lucifer, and he's not the Jesus of the Scriptures. But why would Joel Osteen? I have no idea. I, I don't know. I, but for the grace of God, I'd be that negative toward Christ myself. Uh, why do people insist on saying that what Christ accomplished with his death, burial, and resurrection can somehow be overturned? Um, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's a very negative world, but who's causing all the trouble? I don't know. It seems to be the talkers uh, who don't bother with the Scriptures, but the Scriptures speak. The Bible says Scriptures say things. So it looks like their argument is with the Scriptures, and our privilege is to posit the Scriptures. Uh, it's like eschatology. I suppose if Hollywood hadn't have written the movie and the sensational novel and all the fiction that was imagined, um, I still don't know why people are so negating and willing to condemn someone because they prefer the good news of the Bible which tells us that God will intervene on our behalf, cut off the tribulation days. Uh, matter of fact, uh, He'll do it for our sake, God's elect. So those of us who are members in one of the Lord's churches, we're the aggregate of God's elect. Um, I don't know why people want to negate that. Uh, they diminish the Lord's church, the body of Christ here on the earth, uh, which any strategically localized assembly is the body of Christ under the headship of Christ. Jesus is there, head of that church, 100%. Um, but really, back to apologetics, I don't know who's troublemakers. Let me see, would it be the text or the talk? Would it be the texters who... <laughs> I would recommend you text while preaching. It's a good time to use the text. And whatever the talk's about, it seems they can get very emotive. They, they get very um, rattled. Um, sometimes people who know that they should be teaching the text imbibe a little talk and maybe go along with the trend, and then they're embarrassed when uh, their brethren, some brethren even whom they've taught, I know I was taught things and how to search the Scriptures. Well, I continue to do that. Uh, so I woke up one day and someone was accusing me of being an old earther. I said, when did it become an accusation? And It was amazing what goes on out there in social media and in the trends of Christian marketing. Uh, I told them I had never heard of being accused or belittled for knowing what the Hebrew Bible says. I told them that was a great effort and great grace from God for me to have the privilege of studying 
these languages and to know absolutely without controversy or without contradiction, without debate, that that word is become. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Ask the talkers. I have no idea. Ask people who invent an entire religion just so they can condemn people for not being a part of it. Uh, we preach the gospel that if believed, when believed by anyone in the world, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, denomination, whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, uh, anything, whatever you are, if the moment you trust this gospel, you're born again. And being born again, uh, you are quickened, brought to life, and you have given a new mind, a mind that will then, uh, you have the privilege of renovating that mind and not being um, fashioned according to this world, but being transformed by the renovation of your mind. Uh, you have a new heart, a heart of flesh, on which the new covenant is written. Uh, the new covenant in paper and pen ink is not the new covenant. That's the scriptures, the graphe, the writings. Um, I just don't know why what it would take for people to be as positive as the Bible. But uh, when televangelists, if you'd have ever told me someone like Joel Osteen would have said uh, things about people who have never even heard the gospel, and yet he, um, he even said that there's many ways to Jesus. There's not even one way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to the Father, and He came to seek and to save us. I would hate to choose which way uh, to get to Jesus. How, how dark and negative is that? So pray for him, uh, encourage people that have followed him to not be discouraged. Uh, we're in a very negative world. People want more than one way for some reason. Um, I don't know how um, a person who comes to the knowledge of the truth could ever want something less than the grandeur and the glory and the love and the majesty of that because having been born again, we receive fruit of the Spirit uh, which is love and joy and peace and patient endurance and gentleness and goodness and meekness and temperance, the temperance being control, composure, and faith. I um, have no idea, except it would make you wonder, are they believing what's written, the good news of Christ that's everlasting, that's unchanging? Uh, I've never knew that I would be in a community where people say it's okay to say you've been saved by Jesus, but it's not okay to say you're always being saved by Jesus. Uh, that's called perfect tense, and that's the way Jesus saves perfectly. I never thought I'd be in a community where people say, well, it's okay to say God has fathered you, and that you've been fathered by God. But it's not okay to say you're always being fathered. Well, that's exactly what the text says. It's called perfect tense. He fathers perfectly. What better news can you hear than that? I hear people say, oh, God loves me. I say, He's always loving you. And you'll always be being loved by Him. So if you like part of it, it's impossible not to enjoy the rest of it. So uh, there is a guarantee in the Bible it's written. He's a person named Holy Spirit. Uh, there is a Savior who once He saves you, He's always saving you. It's called perfect tense. He's a perfect Savior. He perfectly saves. There is a Father in the Bible who once He fathers you, He always fathers you. And whoever is wanting to condemn people based on uh, a red herring of age dating the earth or another red herring of picking a pre, a mid, a post trib which none of those are supported by the Bible. Uh, whoever's doing that is just wanting to take you off the core message of Christ and take you off a Christ-centered um, apologetic because uh, we'll be publishing our own chart that doesn't contradict the tech. What's the big deal about that? And one last thing is I, I've been amazed at <clears throat> how ironic it is people are on the computer using advanced technology to <laughs> continue to perpetuate the lowest level of degree of difficulty of arguments I've ever heard of. It's like they'll bother to use to gain knowledge to use a computer, but not use the computer to gain knowledge of the subject they wish to banter about. And I think that's because when you have nothing inside of you, no light, no love, no new heart, no new mind, no new spirit, when there's nothing quickened and you're not alive to God through Christ Jesus, uh, even someone as uh, wonderful as the opportunity was for Joel Osteen, uh, you can, that negativity can come out. And you can renounce Christ. You can find yourself endorsing another Jesus, preferring uh, to uh, acknowledge Him as equally as the true and living Jesus, uh, which Jesus has nothing to do with that. Jesus is... Uh, God is love, and Jesus loved His Father. He loved us. Uh, so Jesus will be faithful 
to secure for us what we wouldn't do for ourselves. And thankfully, <clears throat> all the trouble that's being caused out there in religion is by people who prefer talk over text. But if you can find a text in the Bible that would remove from the Bible these wonderful truths, these positive things, and if you need to endorse another Jesus, then uh, find in the Bible what's wrong with the greatest Jesus, the only Jesus, the Son of God, the one who propitiated for our sins. Uh, and that's enough, but it was a good question Dr. Garner asked. Is it right to expose these things? Well, by preaching the gospel, preaching what's written, it just simply takes the light of God into the world. The light of the world is taken into a dark place, and people can just mind after, repent of that talk, and repent of all that trouble uh, that they've been first misled into, and then repent of that trouble and come out from it that they're asking others to enter into as well. Uh, that's enough, and uh, God bless you, and enjoy your Bible. Enjoy what you read. Believe every word of it. It's great. It's godly. It's edifying, and it's glorious. Uh, amen.